Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the research uh, seminar series of the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. It's an absolute pleasure, I mean that sincerely and genuinely, to introduce our speaker, Professor Peter Newell, who is Professor of International Relations, International Relations and Professor at the Centre for Global Political Economy and International Development at the University of Sussex. Uh, Professor Newell is known to many of us, I think for the past... Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> for ages. Uh, probably 15, 16, 20 years maybe. Uh, so also known to us as Pete. Uh, Pitt's work is at the intersection of international relations and environmental politics uh, stroke international development. He's very well known internationally for his research in this field. He has worked on issues of environment and development, especially climate change for over 18 years, and conducted research and policy work for the governments of the UK, Sweden, Finland and international organisations such as the United Nations Development Programme, the Global Environmental Facility, and the Inter-American Development Bank. He has also published more than 40 journal articles and 40 book chapters, as well as produced a number of commission studies, working papers, and policy briefs. It's probably more than 40 now, Pete, if your website is not updated. Uh, his publications include the following books, Climate for Change, Non-State Actors and the Global Politics of the Greenhouse, the effectiveness of the EU environmental policy, of EU environmental policy, development and the challenge of globalization, the business of global environmental governance, rights, resources and the politics of accountability, climate capitalism and governing climate change, globalization and the environment, capitalism, ecology and power. And today Pete is going to will be speaking on globalizing green politics towards an ecological global politics. Uh, I believe this forms the basis of your new book, forthcoming book, Pete. So uh, without our further ado, over to you. And again, warm welcome. It's been great to have you in the school. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming along. I wanted to just say before I start, also, big thanks to Rich and Tim for organising things. So I could be here for, to, to Matt as sponsor and for sorting me out with recommendations for all the best places on campus for, for yeah. food, including to today's burrito, which is slowly working its way down. Um, to uh, Susan and Ross as well, who helped me get sorted when I first arrived. Um, and to lots of people around the room that I've had really, really useful and productive conversations with over the last few weeks. So big thanks from me. So what I want to do then is talk about um, this book project that I've been working on uh, since September, so it's still fairly early days in a way. It's very much work in progress. Uh, inevitably, it's already been waylaid by other writing commitments, funding bids, uh, etc. So it's, the chapters are very much at draft stage. And this is actually the first time um, I've presented this material. Um, and given the time constraints, I think what I'm going to do is focus on those parts of the book um, on green global politics, which address questions of security and the state principally, because I know there's lots of interest in those themes around the table, so hopefully that might be of more interest to you, and hopefully I'll get uh, some useful feedback on my thinking on those issues so far. Um, the starting point really for the book, the background if you like, is the obvious acknowledgement, or obvious to many of you I'm sure, that environmental issues are clearly on the international uh, agenda, fairly, have a fairly assured place, if you like, on uh, the international political agenda. We've had almost 50 years now of environmental multilateralism, environmental diplomacy. Um, global environmental politics as a sub-discipline of, of IR is also fairly well established and recognised, I think, um, even if seen by um, you know, certain scholars in the discipline are still slightly on the periphery. Uh, but the same cannot be said of green politics. And so I'm drawing here a little bit on the distinction that Andy Dobson and others draw between environmentalism on the one hand and ecologism on the other. And it's that latter category, the more radical uh, political ecology, green politics with a big G, if you like, that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. And it's my sense that um, there's important potential contributions from green thinking in relation to underlying causes and potential solutions to a number of problems or crises that we face in the world today um, around you know, financial crisis, poverty, war, resource conflicts, uh, climate change, uh, to name a few. And yet, despite that potential, that latent potential, uh, green perspectives on global politics have, 
uh, not been sufficiently articulated and have yet to really gain traction. So in a modest, perhaps immodest way, that's what this book project is, is trying to, to remedy. Um, and there's a sense of opportunity, perhaps, in trying to advance this, this type of agenda um, at this historical conjuncture, if you like, given that um, old fault lines of left and right to some extent fraying, perhaps being replaced by a toxic mix of um, nationalism, populism, xenophobia, but at the same time, and this is more relevant for the project I'm talking about today, um, an increasing scepticism, perhaps, about the ability of current political and economic systems to offer adequate responses to society's problems. So even you know, an open questioning of the excesses of, of capitalism uh, amongst proponents of, of neoliberalism. And certainly a receptiveness to ideas about transition and even the language of transformation creeping into discussions around sustainability. So governments, cities, businesses uh, explicitly having transition plans, transition plans to a sustainable society. You know, having targets and, uh, and strategies for achieving this. So that, that language is out there, it's increasingly accepted. There's also, of course, an increasing engagement with an acknowledgement of uh, the need for perhaps alternative metrics of economic growth, or to even reframe uh, the goals of development around prosperity, well-being, buen vivir, things like this, mm. rather than growth per se as an end in itself. So there's a sort of a shift that's going on there, which I think is interesting and provides potentially another an opening here. So what's interesting for me is that this sort of growing, perhaps grudging acceptance of many green ideas without acknowledging them as coming from, from green thinking, green philosophy. And, and there I'm referring to ideas like uh, prosperity without growth, thinking around resilience, around food and energy security, uh, the need to strengthen local economies. So insofar as emulation is the highest form of flattery, um, you can argue that Greens should be delighted. Um, and at the same time, intellectually, I think the whole debate about the Anthropocene um, and the extent to which it forces a reconsideration of global politics um, and has prompted calls by um, uh, colleagues in this country, for example, Anthony Burke and co, for a planet politics. I don't know how many people here are aware of that set of debates and interventions. It's a piece published in Millennium uh, a couple of years ago and and a response to it, and they've laid out this planet politics manifesto, what they think is wrong with IR, how it needs to address these, these issues more seriously, and it's uh, sparked a debate, which again might be one, one entry point for the sorts of things I'm talking about. And so why, why green politics, why now? Again, there's this sense in which we've got these vast bodies of international environmental law, uh, international environmental agreements, um, transnational environmental governance, so stuff which goes beyond the state system, collaborations between private actors and cities and, and social movements of one sort or another. Um, so that, that architecture is in place, and yet there's still this deepening sense of, of an ecological crisis, um, perhaps most obviously drawn attention to by ideas around planetary boundaries which again, some of you will probably be familiar with, the idea that there's these critical ecological thresholds around climate change, biodiversity, fresh water, etc., which we're rapidly surpassing and overshooting. Um, and that's tied to the sense in which the key trends in the global economy, if you like, around trade, production, finance, etc., are, are passing those limits. They're not in any way in line with or aligned with the need to live within those uh, planetary boundaries. Alongside that, we're getting stronger uh, critiques of environmentalism and the way in which it's dealing with these threats coming from IR scholars like Peter Deverne in his book on environmental, environmentalism of the rich or his book with Genevieve Le Baron on Protest Inc. And really their critique is around the way in which the environmental movement, in their view, has been <coughs> sidetracked by the politics of incrementalism or a preoccupation with market environmentalism uh, in particular. So there's a sort of strong critique coming from, from that side. Um, and so, for me, this suggests the need for sort of clearer articulations um, of an alternative politics and strategies. Um, partly also to check what I'm seeing in the environmental movement is a growing sense of defeatism. Uh, and again, one or two of you may have heard of projects like the Dark Mountain Project and other groups of environmentalists that are essentially arguing that uh, we have to prepare for what's to come. The apocalypse is more or less imminent that you know we're in the end game of this civilization. Um, that any attempts to try and reform, shape consumer behaviour, engage with governments, corporations are more or less doomed uh, because uh, you know it's, it's too late to turn this around, and therefore the preparation is more a bottom-up one about you know life after after collapse effectively. 
And so in the face of that, I'm still engaged in a project of trying to conceive of a global politics that might be compatible with some of these challenges and, and constraints. And so I think there is a need for a, a multilateralist and internationalist um, politics of uh, green global politics, um, which can address some of these issues. And I'd argue that green politics does have a role to play. But in order for it to play that role, it has to face up to and deal with a whole series of tensions in the theory and practice of green politics, some of which uh, I'll draw out as I go through. Um, so why the global aspect of green politics? I mean, you could argue that all green politics is intrinsically uh, global. Uh, the political community with which it's most concerned is not um, it's not constrained by sovereignty or, or traditional notions of national identity. The community of responsibility that they're interested in is, is intergenerational in many ways. Uh, it also extends to, to non-human species. Um, a lot of green parties, political parties, insofar as they are one expression of ecologism in practice, are also often deeply internationalist uh, in their outlook. And again, that reflects the origins of green philosophy and thinking in uh, feminist movements, peace movements, and environmental movements. So they're, they're sort of, their outlook, their mode of organisation is almost intrinsically go global, uh, captured perhaps uh, in that the classic sort of maxim, think globally, um, act locally. Uh, and yet in spite of all of that, despite this potential, despite the, the sort of shifts I've been describing, insights from green politics have been remarkably absent in thinking about uh, global politics. And again, I'm making a distinction here between ecologism and, um, and environmentalism and the study of the environment in IR. And so there's a book published uh, and a volume thereafter which Martin contributed to. This was way back in the late 90s, early 2000s um, by Lafayette and Stout on, on international relations theory and ecological thought. And they're making the claim there that IR had failed to sort of appreciate the potential contribution of this literature. Uh, and in many ways I think that criticism still, still holds today. And I say that in spite of clear contributions that I'll be engaging with from people like Robin Eckersley and Eric Haliner and others on particular aspects of, of this area, um, and the renewed interest in, in post-human IR, as it's, it's sometimes referred to. And still, I think, if you look at a lot of IR textbooks, uh, there's very few, with uh, the exception of the volume by Dan and the DevaTech one, of course, that have chapters on green politics rather than the environment as, a, as an issue area, if you like. You know, there's still quite a lot of neglect there. And again, looking back through the sort of history of the discipline, you can find early interests from um, like Harold and Margaret Sprout and Dennis Perridge's and people like this, you know, from the 60s through to the 80s, touching on some of these big world order questions in relation to, uh, to the environment, but not necessarily uh, developing what I'm referring to as, as ecologism here. Um, now part of the answer you could um, say comes, goes back to Steve Smith's critique um, of the environment and IR, which she wrote in about 93, I think it was, trying to explain why the environment was on the periphery of IR. And one of the things he came up with, which I think is true, I mean, there are lots of problems with that article, uh, but one of his key explanations was that it was too easily co-opted, uh, if you like, by liberal institutionist thinking in IR. Um, and regime theory, broad, broadly speaking, is still the dominant paradigm and way in which environmental issues uh, get treated, and that's to the neglect of the sorts of things I'm talking about here. Clearly in IPE, there's been uh, more more progress, if you like, this, you know, huge volumes of work on globalisation and the environment that myself and others here have contributed to. Um, but again, less so on green thinking. I mean, Julian Serene early on wrote about using sort of Butchin's social ecology. Uh, Matt Patton's just published a book called, called Thinking Ecologically about the IPE. So some of this is, is moving forward. Some attempt to engage with concepts from environmental, though less green economics, around ecologically uneven exchange, ecological debts, etc. Uh, but still, this project has not gone as far as it might. Now, for the point of view of planet politics uh, and that whole debate, um, the claim made there, and I, let me just sort of throw out one quote which sort of shows why they think IR is, is falling short here in its ability or willingness to engage with, with these sorts of issues. They argue that if the biosphere is collapsing and if international relations has always presented itself as that discourse which takes the global as its point of departure, how is it that we, IR scholars, diplomats and leaders, have uh, not engaged with the planetary real? And even David Chandler and co in their critical response to the Planet Politics Manifesto also argue IR is inherently the discipline that has the responsibility for considering global processes and this, uh, this is a responsibility it's thus far failed to shoulder. So 
coming from that point of view, these, these claims are, are being made quite strongly. I would argue the, the neglect is actually mutual as well, that all, ecologists need to engage with debates in global politics and I are far more uh, thoroughly than they've done so, uh, so far. Um, I think it's often assumed, if you lead, read a lot of the green political theory, that type of literature, it's often assumed that once the proper ec ecological society, the nature of which is often quite poorly defined, is created, the global political system will uh, simply sort itself out. Uh, that you know, sovereignty, territoriality, <coughs> interstate competition, all of these remnants of the Westphalian order will simply sort of wither or, or fall into harmonious place in an ecological society. And so in a way what I'm trying to address is this mutual, this mutual neglect. So the book. Uh, what I try to do uh, is take key areas of global politics and in each case look at the critique of the prevailing way of uh, dealing with these things, of organising um, into global politics, what the normative vision is and then what the thinking is uh, around strategy. Um, and in lots of cases it's about me taking core ideas, principles, precedents and trying to extend them um, or insinuate what, what the implications might be for, for global politics. So I do that in relation to security, economy, the state, global governance, development and sustainability. So it's a big, ambitious <laughs> project, hence I'm only going to talk about a couple of bits of it uh, today. But my, you know, the main claim is that I think there are some rich, distinct critiques, visions, utopias, if you like, as well as thinking about strategies, which is useful for uh, people interested in studying global politics. And so I'm drawing on green writers, thinkers, philosophers in trying to do this, but also you know, part of what I'm doing is a response to the um, articulated need on the part of green uh, activist thinkers to, to think through um, their, what they can contribute to, to global politics to try and visibilise mainstream green thinking in this, in this key area. So what I'm not doing is trying to sort of articulate a new theory of IR. It's very much an extension um, of, of some of this green thinking, pushing it in, in new uh, directions. Clearly it implies critiques of, of existing theories and perspectives in lots of ways, but it's not a macro theory of world order or change. It doesn't speak to a new theory necessarily of, of war or why inst international institutions emerge, um, are effective or not, or, or fail. So it's more about you know, creating resources for, for making sense of the world in, in, in new ways without setting itself up as, a, as an alternative to the big isms in IR, if you like. Now, which green politics am I talking about? Those of you familiar with ecological thought will know it's a huge, it's a broad church, it's a big spectrum of, of thinking, and it covers anything from social ecology and eco-Marxism to eco-anarchism, eco-feminism, deep ecology. Uh, and I draw on these different uh, strands of thinking in, uh, as and when they're relevant to the particular area that I'm, that I'm dealing with. Um, and each have a you know, slightly different account of the cause of ecological crises, if you like, whether they ground it in patriarchy, capitalism, anthropocentrism, industrialism, etc., as well as the strategies they have, of course, for, for resolving it. But all of them take as given, and again, as opposed to environmentalists or some environmentalists, the unsustainability of, of the current uh, system and, and make a strong argument for radical overhaul as opposed to incrementalism. So let me jump in um, to the two key themes. Firstly, security. So I'll start with security for fairly ob obvious reasons or reasons that will be obvious to most of you in this room. It's the number one issue in, in IR. It's a sort of, if you're going to say something about IR and global politics, you have to have something to say about security, you might argue. Um, and yet, despite the absolute centrality of the politics of survival in orthodox representations of IR, ecological questions have largely been uh, neglected. And again, Burke pick up on this, saying that IR is one of the few disciplines that's explicitly devoted to the pursuit of survival, yet it has almost nothing to say in the face of a possible mass extinction event. I put it very, very strongly. And this, of course, is notwithstanding the big literature on environmental change and security that Matt and others have, have contributed to. And there is an antagonism, you can argue, between this sort of more holistic, interdependent uh, ecological thinking, if you like, of greens and the, and the territorial zero-sum uh, competitive thinking of, of security, more traditional security thing, thinking. And so green thinking would have a lot in common with critical security studies, perhaps, with mm. ideas around human security, and with claims that someone like Ken Booth would make around, you know, the, for a lot of the majority of the world's population, the primary threat. Uh, comes from their own state and not from an enemy one. That would speak to green critiques of uh, you know, state violence and, and repression. Um, and as Matt has noted in, in some of his work, you know, people displaced by environmental disasters or stresses may be positioned as threats to the security of the state rather than as those in need of being secured. 
Um, so let me draw out a few critiques. One is around militarism and the sources of violence and conflict. Um, so again, given the sort of the history of the green movement and its base in, in um, links to peace movements, um, if you think about key organisations like Greenpeace, whose name reflects the fact they were interested in sort of avoiding nuclear, nuclear holocaust and, and, and ecological collapse, um, there's the, the strong uh, undercurrents of uh, anti-militarism and pacifism in, in green thinking. Um, and I think it taps into potentially or speaks to some of the debates now in IR around, around militarism and pacifism that are in great, getting increasing attention in the discipline. So, you know, Patrick Jackson's work on, in this area or Anna Stavrinakis and Jan Selby, colleagues of mine working on, on militarism. By militarism, what they mean here um, is the sort of preparation for a normalisation and lit legitimation of war. Or, as I think Jan put it, the social and international relations for the preparation and conduct of organised political violence. So it's a broader, broader category they're talking about here. So it's not just institutionalised violence and its embodiment in the state, but the sources of violence manifest in everyday insecurity, brought about by patterns of domination, patriarchy, masculinist culture, etc. As you can see, the, the you know the feminist inflection coming through there. So it's militarism in society that I think is the subject of critique. Um, the, you know, the social acceptance, celebration, embedding of military values in society. But in green thinking, militarism is also a function of and intrinsically linked to the capitalist industrial society of which it's a part and whose project it sort of polices and structures it's called upon uh, to enforce in a home and abroad. So unlike sort of Marxist theories of imperialism, it's not about capitalism per se, but it's industrialism. This is an important distinction for greens. It's about a wealth accumulation machine extractivism, whether it's held in public hands or private hands. So it's not just about capitalism, it's about industrialism as a, as a system, which is the problem for, for a lot of Greens. So you could argue that Green perspectives offer a more holistic, social, deeper understanding of the social economic causes of conflict and violence, and why they persist and endure. And in a lot of Green thinking, you find frequent references to the ways in which those systems are all organised and maintained. Um, so you will find references to the military-industrial complex or, or the deep state and, and ideas like this. For Greens, what's particularly problematic is that it, it's that, that that system of militarism enables economic expansion and growth and the lock-in to unsustainable pathways. So that project can be sustained precisely because of military interventions uh, elsewhere. So that's one set of uh, critiques, if you like. Another would be around the ecological cost of war and militarism, of course. Um, so, you know, Robin Eckersley and, and others have talked a lot about just the actual like, environmental impact of militarism as being one of the key drivers of the very crisis we face. If you think of military training, weapon production, storage, disposal, conflict, whether it's nuclear, chemical, biological, it obviously extracts a huge impact. That's to say nothing of the use of the environment as a tool of war, you know, going back to Vietnam and Agent Orange, but also, you know, Kuwait, burning the oil wells, etc. But again, in green thinking, it's not just about those spectacular, irregular occurrences uh, in terms of the impacts of militarism, but also the everyday. Um, and so they draw attention, for example, to the vast amounts of fossil fuels consumed by uh, military uh, systems. So the US military alone, for example, uses more oil than any other institution in the world, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. So just as, as a machine for extracting resources, it's something which deserves attention in and of, its, on, in and of itself. So what would be the alternative? What would be a normative vision um, of green security? From, so from an ecological point of view, I think you'd probably argue that... Um, Violence against others in an interconnected planet uh, is, is an act of self-harm in lots of ways, that devastation of environments in other parts of the world at some point in some way will come back to, to bite you through global circulations of air, water pollution or climate change, etc. So in that sense, zero-sum notions make no sense from a, from a green point of view. There's only boomerang effects and in, in a longer term and in an absolute sense there are no winners. Um, pacifism and non-violence has a central place in the normative vision of green security. There's a lot of emphasis on conflict resolution, peace building. Um, and it's pacifism not only in the sense of being anti-war, but also linked perhaps to anarchist critiques of the state, which Greens are, some Greens are, are, um, uh, engage with, that the only way to eliminate war is to sort of remove the capacity for institutionalised and systematic violence. So it is about disassembling decapacitating, if you like, the power of the state to commit uh, acts of wars or conscript civilians into, into war. 
Greens would also argue, though, that a move away from uh, a more extractivist new liberal economy, which they would advocate, um, would enable this process of, of demilitarisation insofar as state violence is obviously employed to enable that extractivism through land grabbing, green grabbing, those sorts of things. Um, and insofar as Greens are in favour of a, a more autarkic state, a uh, decentralised state, uh, more disconnected from the global economy, uh, there may be fewer reasons to have to extract resources overseas, so fewer oil and resource wars, fewer reasons to go to war, you might, might argue. Perhaps, therefore, fewer um, sources of grievance-based radicalism or extremism. Now, of course, from an IR point of view, the comeback to this would probably be a liberal peace type argument, right? That you would say um, that trade and economic independence amongst liberal states is a key means of securing peace, building on you know, Kant's idea about perpetual peace, you know, the spirit of commerce being the thing that holds, uh, holds countries together. Greens would counter that probably, or try to, by saying, look, autark autarkic or not, if the state's military capacity has been substantially reduced, its ability to engage in warfare is compromised. What they would also do probably is point to the, the violence involved in sustaining an, an open international trading system. Um, that meeting those imperatives of trade and export-led extractivism also generates all sorts of violence, albeit not so much on an interstate basis. And so they might try and claim that the reciprocal vulnerability that sort of underlies some of the liberal peace type ideas could be achieved by other means than just deepening and extending the chains of commerce, if you like, over larger distances. Um, but I think Greens, to, to make that argument seriously, do need to think about what would be the basis of that perpetual peace with, when there are fewer material dependencies. In other words, can liberal values outlive the belief in sustaining an ever-expanding global economy? And I think there's, there's further work to do. So in terms of the strategy, if that's the normative vision, the strategy would be around uh, potentially emphasising the role of environmental factors in, um, in exacerbating conflict, which, which many people have done, trying to green uh, traditional security agendas. And of course there is growing interest from the military establishment in these issues, concerns around refugees, conflicts over oil and water, health security pandemics, etc. That in turn has produced a series of critiques of some of the more neo-Malthusian narratives, if you like, around conflicts and diminishing resources. Um, but also a push towards ecological security that Matt and Robin and others have, have been uh, pushing for which can take different forms. So for the Planet Politics crowd, it's around an Earth Security Council. Others have talked about a UN Ecological Security Council, use of green berets, uh, etc. cetera. Um, for others, it's not about ecologizing security. It's more about uh, democratizing security uh, in various ways. So trying to subject that part of state action, if you like, to more oversight and autonomy, or, or desecuritization, if you like, trying to remove more issues from the domain of the exceptional and into the domain of, of normal politics. Um, another strategy would be around peace and arms control. So a lot of Greens are very active in uh, you know, movements to strengthen international environmental law around the arms trade, around trying to ban nuclear weapons. So there was the, um, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons adopted in 2017 that you're probably all aware of. You know, a lot of Greens and peace activists heavily involved in that. But again, there's a, a dilemma for Greens about how far a Green state would be in a position to advance and carry any weight in those sorts of negotiations if at the same time they're wanting a, you know, a smaller state, a, 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 in a way a deliberately weaker state. A third area that Greens often fall back on is what they call democratic defence. And this was a title of a book written by Peter Tatchell, who's an LGBT activist and Green Party candidate in the UK, quite well-known activist. I wrote this book many years ago now on what he called democratic defence. And here it's much more about self-defence, civil disobedience, lots of references to you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, those sorts of uh, strategies, talking about the need to create a people's army, <coughs> emphasis on repurposing the military industrial complex uh, for alternative purposes and some green thinking now looking at examples of where that's been possible things like the Lucas plan in the UK where workers um, working for a, an armaments plant there came up with an alternative vision of how their jobs could be protected and alternative socially useful production could be achieved so there's sort of interest in those those type of projects. And of course there are differences amongst greens among between those that are pure pacifists if you like and those that would accept a role for conventional weapons um, as part of a transitional strategy away from, from nuclear weapons. Um, so, that's security. So the last 15 minutes, let me move on to the state. 
the state is obviously features centrally in a lot of green debates about the pos prospects and possibilities of a transition to a sustainable society. And you get, again, across the spectrum, a huge diversity of perspectives from more anarchist traditions around stateless, gov you know, self-governing communities, big emphasis on decentralisation, subsidiarity. Um, and on the other hand, from you know, Robin Eckersley, um, James Meadowcroft, people like that, talking about a transnational state, uh, a green state, that would, you know, where you would extend responsibilities, governance mechanisms globally. Um, so sort of slightly pulling in the opposite direction. So depending on which body of work you look at, the state's either you know, too large, too small, too captured, too compromised, too exploitative. Uh, to, to deal with these, these uh, challenges. So on the one hand, you get impulses from, from the peace movement, wanting to disassemble state functions in some of the ways I've, I've talked about. And yet feminist thinking in green politics is keen to preserve or even extend state capacities in other directions when it comes to, to welfare, protection, redistribution. So if you think, for example, a lot of Greens, I don't know in Australia, but elsewhere, are very keen on a basic income scheme. This is sort of foundational policies for them. And that would obviously require a, a potentially a larger state, a better resource state in lots of ways. So there's all these sorts of tensions. There's not a clear consensus, I think, around the role of the state. If anything, as John Barry and others have said, there tends to be more of a, an accent, I mean, he calls it a monopolisation, I think that's probably an exaggeration, of the more anarchist vision, a sort of, you know, outwardly critical stance towards uh, the state and a suspicion about the green state as essentially an oxymoron given its role in, in militarism and, and extractivism. Um, clearly it depends on which state we're talking about. A lot of work more on environmental transitions I'm talking about now than, than green political theory, assumes a European state. A lot of the, the case studies, the empirical material, the examples, uh, make assumptions about a fairly powerful, autonomous, well-resourced state, a liberal market economy, an active civil society. And clearly those assumptions don't travel well or don't necessarily describe well uh, majority world settings. So there's, there's a um, great, much greater need for nuance, I think, rather than talking about the state in in quite broad brush uh, and universal terms, as well as in relation to the, the political economies of, of, of which they're part. So I think this is a key challenge for me for, for Greens, like what's fixed, universal and given about the characteristics and functioning of states and what can be reversed, reformed and done away with given other historical, political or economic uh, circumstances. So I think this is something Greens really need to, to try and address. Their critiques of the state would fall into sort of three areas. One is the centralising undemocratic state, so you get a lot of critiques about the bureaucratic, administrative state, the concentration of political power, which is seen to be fundamentally at odds with green visions of participatory democracy, the green public sphere. Uh, and Greens often point out that liberal democracies perform quite poorly in protecting the interests of future generations. They're um, prone to you know, reactive responses, dealing with election cycles, uh, captured by interest groups. Uh, of one sort or another, whether it's corporations or trade unions who have a big stake in sustaining the economy as it is. Um, so that's one sort of uh, critique. And Greens are often talk, described in relation to these debates as somehow post-liberal in a way, um, in the sense that there's a concern with this, in, particularly in capitalist in, or industrialised states, this momentum towards progress rules out rational deliberation over its purposes and direction that decision-making is often consciously loaded in favour of, of industrial interests in ways that environmental justice literatures have drawn attention to, both in terms of procedural injustices and distributional ones. Um, what comes up more and more in debates about um, the role of the state in green thinking is this question of urgency, um, and it's tied to what Eric Swingerdale refers to as post-politics. I don't know if many people have come across this debate, but basically he's, he's talking about the dangers implicit in highlighting the urgency and, uh, of dealing with environmental threats as a way of extending state power in new directions, that normal democratic politics as usual somehow have to be suspended in order to deal with this, this issue. Um, I mean, you see it in a very concrete and real way, for example, in the UK, decisions around pushing forward a new wave of nuclear power plants or going for fracking. And when there's opposition to it from local authorities, the central state bypassing that uh, on the basis of the need to speed and the move towards a lower carbon economy. So it's that type of thing. But it, there's a, so there's a certain category and set of issues and urgency attached to them, which means that the normal democratic procedures uh, shouldn't apply. And this, this creates concern about scope for top-down, undemocratic solutions or more techno-managerial solutions. 
And some of the critique of planet politics from you know, David Chandler and co. picks up on these sorts of themes, um, that there's these sort of fantasies or illusions of control around the imposition of, of technologies or solutions that are seen to be in the collective interest or that can be read off the needs of you know, the biosphere. Um, now, of course, this extension of state power for ecological ends doesn't just um, concern Greens. Market liberals would also push back on it and be critical of Greens for um, restrictions on civil liberties or individual freedoms around things like birth control, consumption choices, lifestyle choices. There's a, there's a sort of a, a right-wing or a market liberal critique of green thinking along, along those lines. Again, Greens would come back on that and say that um, this notion of a laissez-faire state given its implication in, in sustaining this unsustainable system um, is, is fanciful and problematic. It's sort of parading as a neutral arbiter of these interests, but uh, clearly in favour of, of um, some actors over others. And that relates to the sort of second area of, of critique around the state, which is the industrial capitalist state. So insofar as Greens have a whole critique, as you probably know, around limits to growth, um, there's concern about the state's role in um, reproducing that system, that system you know, using coercion, regulation, law, disciplining citizen process, engaging in acts of dispossession of one sort or another, um, in order to sustain or even hide what you know, eco-Marxists would refer to as the, the second contradiction of capitalism, right? that it, it undermines its ability to, to reproduce itself over, over time. But again, for Greens, this isn't about capitalism per se, and this is where they part with people on the left often, but it's about industrialism uh, as, a, as a system. Now again, one interesting entry point here is both to think historically, um, you know, as Ryan and others would, about the project of the economy and growth uh, as something that's fairly modern and actually new, um, and whether there's scope to, to revisit that, to rethink it, as some people are trying to do, as, as I mentioned early on. That's one thing. Is there something that's... Uh, fixed about growth and how we pursue it? Is it something that's structurally related to the, the purpose of the state or is it something that can be, can be shifted in, in new uh, and greener directions, if you like? Or are there tensions around the relationship between accumulation and legitimation um, that create opening for green strategies to sort of delegitimise particular accumulation st uh, strategies? So the normative vision is obviously, there are many, <laughs> One is one version of the green state is the Robin Eckersley type idea. So you're building on ecological modernisation. You're talking about the gradual entrenchment, institutionalisation of green values, shifts in core state uh, competences to to adapt to these realities. And so for her, it's it's too hasty to assume that the structures of anarchy, capitalism, liberal democracy are necessarily anti-ecological. Um, there are ways in which you could imagine some of the basic raison d'etre of the state could be revised, uh, could be reined in by certain alternative social ecological norms. So she talks a lot about ecological uh, stewardship, transboundary um, democracy, ecological citizenship, places a lot of faith in multilateralism, um, environmental ag advocacy, the enshrinement of principles around precaution, polluter pays, these sorts of things as ways of, of uh, tackling these issues. Now again, the pushback from other green thinkers would be that we've had plenty of all of those things. We've got lots of multilateralism, we've got very effective advocacy, and we have had for many, many years. Um, we are seeing attempts at, to push so-called earth systems governance. None of these things is reversing the key trends, so there would be a pushback about how, how effective those things are. Uh, so for someone like Andy Dobson, it's a more fundamental thing about a new ecological social contract, um, which would be trying to increase decision-making power over the design and shape of the economy, society and politics, but within ecological limits set by the state. And it's that fact, the fact that certain areas are opened up to more scrutiny, but other limits are set that makes uh, Greens not so much anti-liberal, you might argue, but, but post-liberal. Of course, that's very different from the anarchist-type vision, which, which dominates in a lot of green thinking, which is much more about self-governing communities, mutual aid, uh, re-commoning. You hear this a lot now in green debates, right? Greens and others talk about the need for re-commoning, protecting areas that haven't yet been subject to enclosure, uh, but also expanding those, those uh, spaces uh, of autonomy. So what's the strategy, just to sort of finish off, how on earth would Greens move towards a green society? Um, I think in the short term, the existence and continuation of a, of a state is, is a reality most Greens have to deal with. There are still aren't many social institutions that have the capacity and at least potential legitimacy uh, that states have to, to 
to do the sort of, to undertake the sort of tra uh, transition that we're talking about to deal with incumbent actors as well as uh, push forward alternatives. And so I'm reminded in some ways of Hedley Ball's caution about the, the Council of Despair, <laughs> you know, demanding the abolition of the state as a prerequisite for, for building an alternative society <coughs> rather than sort of working, working with what's there. And so despite these critiques and the uh, enduring resonance and appeal of anti-statism in green politics and theory, I think you know, day to day, as you know, a lot of activists still orient their activities towards state. And I think we need to be much more nuanced about which aspects of state power we're talking about, which ones we want more of or less of. Andy Dobson talks about the sort of thinking about the telescope analogy that they, you know, the lens can be expanded or retracted depending on which part of the state you're, you're wanting to talk about. You know that you can't just talk about the state in those uh, more general terms. So let me sum up then, with just a few minutes to go. Um, clearly, the great green state would be a different type of state. I think there's um, scope for a more activist, interventionist state. Um, willing to articulate an alternative to have to address the power of incumbent actors that are that have you know very strong material interest in, in uh, unsustainable development willing to drive forward technology investment innovation uh, in new areas but it would be post-liberal in that decisions about investment production consumption would but not be assumed to be private they would have to be subject to a greater degree of, of political oversight um, and greens again will have to be clear about that what's possible in particular context, right? And depending very much on which state we're talking about, its nature, capacity, the, the, its location within the, the global political economies, etc. So co to conclude, what I've tried to show just through these two areas, and again, I could have talked about many more, um, is just to sort of flag the potential value, insights, applications from green thinking to a couple of key areas of global politics. And I think there's potential, as well as many challenges and tensions and contradictions that Greens need to work through if they're going to make this sort of contribution that I think uh, can be made. Um, it's my contention. It doesn't really seek to articulate a new theory of, of the international law. It's not a new ism in IR, but it does offer a rich source of critiques, alternative visions, and now draws on you know, 50 years' worth of strategising around how to achieve um, some of these outcomes. I think I'm wary of some of the nature determinism that you get in some of these debates, um, and you know we can pick up on whether planet politics is guilty of that. But you get some of these sort of ecological-based superstructure type arguments uh, sometimes creeping in that we have to read off nature what the appropriate prescriptions are for us as society, and sometimes that comes through in Earth systems governance prescriptions or you know, possibly some of the, the planet politics um, type stuff. So, and I think we need to, again, the critics of, of planet politics argue that, that this problematic desire to jump straight to the limits of human freedom on the basis of what the planet is telling us is, you know, is, is problematic. Um, but I do think what I've sketched out here, obviously today I've just talked about security in the state, does help to unsettle some key assumptions and articulate some of the alternatives at a time when they're, when they're needed. So I'll, I'll stop there because I can see the clock has hit quarter two. Oh, that was well done. Thank you, Pete. That was 